Good morning to you and welcome to the live stream service of the New Church of Boulder Valley. Thanks for being with us today. It's good to see you. And uh, it's been a hard week and I hope that you're doing okay. And uh, I think it's good that we're all together to hopefully get a message of hope and love from the Lord and some inspiration and comfort. And, uh, you know, and being together, even though it's virtually, is heartwarming and uplifting. So thanks for being here. Uh, there are materials for the service posted on the, the Facebook page as well. There's another posting that has the readings and order of service and songs and the interlude lyrics. So you're welcome to look at those as well. But let's start with just a short prelude called Dona Nobis Pachem, which means grant us peace or give us peace.
Now let's sing together our first song, Myriad. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Amen. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord, our creator and God, your message is so clear in your word that we are to love one another as you have loved us. And we thank you for your example with your life on earth. You taught us how to love and forgive and to show mercy and grace. Lord, open the pages of your word today and open our minds and open our hearts and hands that we may serve and love and care for each other as you care for us. Lord, we ask for your protection and guidance, and we ask for hope that change can happen because you have given us freedom to do so. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. All right, we're going to begin this morning with our talk for the children. And children, one of the things that uh, we need to be clear on in life is that when we make a choice, every choice that we make has a consequence or has a, something that happens because of it. The Lord actually tells us that every choice we make or every decision has a series of consequences or a ripple that goes on to eternity. So we think about the choices that we make and how that might infect our life. And the story today is about the Garden of Eden. And you might remember that story where the Lord created a beautiful garden where everything was there that anyone could possibly ever want. 
all the food. It's a beautiful place to be. There is trees to eat the fruit of. And the Lord made it very clear that there are two trees that one you should eat of all the time. That's the tree of life and eat its fruit. And that tree is the idea that the Lord is in charge of everything, that the Lord gives us everything. and The Lord loves us and cares for us. And there's a tree that we're not supposed to eat of. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that is the idea that we can figure everything out by ourselves and we don't really need the Lord, that we're smart enough without him. So Adam was put in this garden and eventually was given a wife, Eve, and they had this very clear instructions. You have a choice. I have everything laid out for you and it's wonderful. Eat of the tree of life. Have the Lord as your center, but don't eat of that tree. So it's clear. Don't eat from that tree. Eat from that tree. So they had freedom to do what they wanted. Well, let's read the story, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Now, the serpent, or the snake, was more cunning than any beast. Cunning means kind of tricky. Than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. It's very clear. Don't eat that tree. You will die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, it looks nice, and a tree desirable to make one wise, She took of its fruit, and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the human and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God sent the human out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So the Lord God drove the human out of the garden. Amen. I already talked about how choices have consequences. So they made a choice to not listen to the Lord and to listen to the snake instead, and that had consequences. They ended up being kicked out of the garden. They couldn't live there anymore where everything was provided for them. And they had to till the ground instead of it all growing freely for them, and they could just enjoy it. They had to plant and dig and weed and care for stuff and grow it and eat it that way. And also said that Eve would then have pain when she gave birth to children. That would be hard instead. So these sort of consequences came because of the choice they made. But why did they do that? Why did they make that choice? Why didn't they listen to the Lord? Why didn't the Lord stop it from happening? I know these are some of the questions that we might have. Why would the Lord let them make that choice? Well, the Lord loves us all very much. And one of the things that the Lord knows helps us to be happy is when we have freedom and when we have choice, when we can make decisions for ourselves. If we were just created and the Lord decided everything for us and made us do this and made us do that, it wouldn't really be very fun. We wouldn't have a very nice life. We know what that's like when you want to maybe make something in the kitchen or cook something and you want to be able to do it all by yourself. You don't want your mom or dad to make it for you. You want to make it for yourself. You can ask for help and that's great, but you want to feel like you did it all by yourself. And that's the joy the Lord wants us to have. The reason that they made that choice is they listened to the serpent instead of to the Lord. And the serpent has a special meaning in the Lord's word. It pictures our senses, our sensory experience. So the things that we see with our eyes, the things that we smell, things that we taste, things that we hear, and things that we touch. And those are very useful things to have but they are not always going to tell us what's true. We need actually to know from the Lord's word what's really true. We can't tell us by looking at something whether it's good or not. Here's a little simple example from the kitchen. Some of you probably have this at home, and you can go open up the cupboard and find it if you're allowed. And it's called cinnamon. And if you open it up, it smells really good. And that smells nice. Maybe I should take a big spoon of it and eat it because it smells so good. Do you know what would happen if I did that? It's very bitter, very tart, and I'd be spitting it out and be like burning my mouth. It's not something 
that you want to stick a spoonful of in your mouth. So you can't just tell by smelling it or looking at it and knowing from that. Or vanilla, another thing you might find in your kitchen. This stuff smells wonderful. Feels like I should just take a big drink out of it, but if I did that, it would be very bitter and very, it doesn't taste good at all. But it smells really good. So we can't really tell just by looking at something whether it's good for us or whether it's good at all. And so when we do that, we can make a lot of decisions that are hurtful to ourselves or to other people. Well, sometimes we make decisions about who we would like or who we think is a good person based on maybe the color of their skin or what their hair is like or their clothes are wearing or whether they have a lot of money or not, or what neighborhood they live in, what country they're from, whether a man or a woman, all these sorts of things that we base whether they're a good person or not on. And those are not accurate. We need to look at the heart. What kind of person are they at heart? We need to take the time to know someone. We can't judge them based on what they look like. So these are the kinds of things that are so important that we be aware of that the snake, the senses, are going to tell us stuff that's just not true. Like if you based all of your decisions on what you're going to eat based on how it tasted, we would just eat ice cream and candy and sugar and potato chips for dinner and lunch and breakfast, right? And what would happen is we would get sick. We would not be well. So we can't base our decisions just on our senses. We need the truth from the Lord's word to help us. That's a really important lesson for us to take with us today, and I hope you'll think about that. But um, thanks for listening, and let's, uh, let's sing our next song. This is called Open Your Eyes. And so you can think about that also as we need to open our eyes, but we also need to open the eyes of our spirit and find out what it is that the Lord wants for us. you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. Lord, we ask for your protection and guidance and comfort and courage for your children. Keep them safe. All of your children you've created in this world are precious in your sight. Help us to see each other as you see us. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. Well, children, you are welcome to stay with us as we continue our service, or if you have the materials that we sent out for a children's program, you're welcome to go do that or whatever it is that your family has planned for you. But thanks for being here. We love you, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. We're going to continue our readings today on this subject of um, sort of like why bad things happen, and, but also the idea of, of human freedom and divine providence or how the Lord leads them and how those balance out. So this next story is another example of people making a bad choice. This is Exodus 31. When the Lord had made an end of speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. 
Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that we shall go, that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they arose early on the next day offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And these final two readings are from the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church. The first is True Christian Religion 483. It says that without free will in spiritual matters, the word would not be of any use, nor in consequence would the church be. Unless we had free will in spiritual matters, that is, in matters concerned with salvation and everlasting life, what would all this be but empty words serving no use? And this is Secrets of Heaven 6489. The nature of the Lord's providence is such that it is linked together with foresight. The one does not exist without the other. For evil things are foreseen, but good ones are provided. And the evil things that are foreseen are constantly being turned towards what is good by means of the Lord's provident arrangement. Since the divine end, which has good in view, governs everything. Nothing is therefore allowed to happen except to the end that something good may come out of it. But because we possess freedom that enables us to be reformed, we are turned from evil towards good so far as we freely allow ourselves to be turned. We are constantly being turned from an utterly dreadful hell, which we make every effort to cast ourselves into, to one that is not so bad if we cannot be led to heaven. Amen. Here end our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. We will now have an interlude.
The storms are raging on the rolling sea and on the highway of regret. The winds of change are blowing wild and free. You ain't seen nothing like me yet. I could make you happy, make your dreams come true. No, there's nothing that I wouldn't do. Go to the ends of the earth for you to make you feel my love. To make you feel my Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. One of the hardest things for us, uh, us to understand is why bad things happen, why there is evil in the world, why the Lord doesn't prevent it from happening. You think about the history of wars in our world and how many millions of people have been killed and innocent lives taken and disrupted. Or something like a car accident where someone gets drunk and they kill somebody else and the life that's destroyed because of that. Or right now the acts of racism are prejudiced that are hurting people and causing chaos and where justice is not feeling like it's served. And it's certainly not the first time that this has happened but we pray it will be the last. Well, right now, the diseases that we're experiencing, the pandemic that we're in, again, where thousands of lives are taken. I think the hardest thing is when children are hurt or children are damaged in some way, someone who's innocent and their lives are lost. And there's a myriad of other examples, but why doesn't the Lord stop that from happening? Doesn't the Lord care about these tragedies? People ask these questions all the time, or if there was a God, why would he let this happen? Well, let's think of the Bible itself, the Lord's book. The Lord gave it to us. It was stories about life and spiritual life and how to treat one another. And there's these examples of people making bad choices over and over again, and the Lord doesn't prevent it. Why? So the story we talked about with the children, the pinnacle of human life, where the Lord created the Garden of Eden and sent Adam and his wife Eve in there and allowed them to be led astray by a serpent and the Lord did not stop it from happening. And their first son, Cain, and his brother Abel, where Cain killed his brother Abel, and the Lord did not withhold him at the time by speaking to him, but only after the deed and cursing him for what he did. And then the other story we read today about the Israelitish nation worshiping a golden calf in the wilderness and acknowledging it as the God that led them out of slavery. And God saw this from Mount Sinai nearby, and did not seek to prevent it from happening. Or David, who was, as king, went out and decided to number all the people. And as a result, a pestilence was sent upon them, and thousands of men perished. And the Lord, not before the deed happened, but after the deed happened, sent the prophet Gad to him and announced the punishment. Or Solomon, the king, was permitted to establish idolatrous worship. And all the kings following him, many of them after him, were permitted to profane the temple and the holy things of the church. And lastly, that nation was permitted to crucify the Lord. And you say, well, why did those things happen? Why are they allowed to happen? Well, there's two general concepts that we have to understand and be reconciled to one another in order to understand or get an idea about this. And the first one is human freedom. That the Lord created us to be free, created us with choice. And we're free to choose what's good. And we're also free at the same time to choose evil. And there's various degrees between that we choose all the time. But we're created to have this feeling of self-life, this feeling that life is our own. And that's a source of our delight in life. It's a source of our contentment. It's what makes us feel human. And on an external level, it's the thing that we fight over all the time is, or that we live for is for freedom. People get very upset when their freedom is impinged upon. That's why we abhor slavery. That's why we abhor control, because it takes away someone's freedom or our freedom. And there's also a very important spiritual principle, which is that nothing 
can become part of who we are spiritually unless it is done in freedom and with our rational mind engaged. We couldn't become good, we couldn't become loving, we couldn't become angels if at the same time we couldn't become evil also. We have to have that freedom in order for it to become real. And we also read in that one of those teachings from the Heavenly Doctrine that if, if the Word itself and the church itself would be completely pointless or useless if we didn't have free will and choice. Because the Word tells us how to live. It tells us the choices we need to make in order to be a happy person. And what difference would it make if we didn't have freedom? The church would be meaningless. The Word would be meaningless. So that's the first thing is human freedom. The second thing is divine providence or how the Lord governs and provides for ours and our eternal welfare and our happiness. And if you haven't read the book, The Divine Providence, written by Emanuel Swedenborg, I suggest you read that book. It's full of wonderful truths about this. What the Lord tells us is what the Lord concerns us himself with is what's eternal and what benefits our eternal welfare. And temporal things are, are a concern if they also affect eternal things or they affect our spiritual life. So one example would be, well, the Lord doesn't necessarily care if you or me is rich or not, unless that impacts our eternal life in some way. Either maybe it helps us to be more generous or maybe it helps us to be more greedy. But if it impacts us in that way, the Lord does care about that. And we get worked up over all kinds of things which the Lord may not care about at all. And that might be a good exercise to ask ourselves about something. I'm really worked up about this on a scale of 1 to 10. How much of this is an eternal issue? How much does this impact mine or somebody else's spiritual life? I also want to tell you that the Lord tells us that there are differing degrees of divine providence. In other words, there's something, part of the divine providence that is really close to being the Lord and what the Lord wants. That's called the Lord's will. And there's something that's really far away from the Lord's will, which is actually even evil that happens. And this is how I understand it. It says that's the Lord's will. That's the highest one. That's what the Lord wants to have happen. Is nothing but good. That's the Lord's will. And then below that is the Lord's good pleasure. It's pretty good. It's acceptable. And then below that, it's the Lord's leave, meaning it's okay. And then below that is sufferance. It means it's not good, but the Lord allows it. And then there's permission at the very bottom. And that's actually evil that the Lord permits. Doesn't cause it to happen, but can't prevent it for the sake of our salvation and because of our freedom. And we can't make a mistake of confusing the Lord's will with the Lord's divine or with permission. That's a very dangerous thing to do. For example, if someone loses a loved one, someone dies and you say, well, it's the Lord's will that that happened. No, it's not. It's absolutely not the Lord's will. The Lord's will is only that good might occur. And if something bad happens, it is not the Lord's will. It might be a permission or it might be something lower than, or above that, but it's not something that is the Lord's will, like a tragedy of some sort. Is that the Lord's will? No. The Lord's not punishing us because of who we are. The Lord doesn't do that. So if something bad happens, it's because of human choices, not because the Lord has willed it to happen. But the Lord is present, governing all things, and he governs us depending on how we make our choices or sort of how we let the Lord into our life. We can let the Lord in by doing what's good and allowing the Lord's will to really govern us. And sometimes we make choices that are evil and the Lord has to govern us with permission. So they're very different. Will and permission are very different things. They're like the difference between what's good and what's evil. And good is provided by the Lord. That's what the Lord is giving us all the time. And evil is foreseen by the Lord and guarded from if at all possible. But evil that is foreseen by the Lord, he sees it's going to happen he tries to bend it to good if possible or a lesser evil if possible. And, but he can't if it's going to take away our eternal freedom. So how the Lord deals with these different things are he's given words for them. One is foresight, how the Lord deals with what's evil, and providence, how the Lord provides for what's good. So allow me to, to share a bit of a passage from the Secrets of Heaven 5155. It says, the providence is used with reference to good, but foresight with reference to evil. For all good flows in from the Lord and is therefore what is provided by him, but all evil flows from hell, that is from the human proprium or self-life, which makes one with hell, and is therefore what is foreseen by him. 
In its dealings with evil, providence is nothing else than the directing and steering of evil towards a milder evil, and as far as possible towards good, but evil itself is foreseen. So one is provided for, made arrangements for, the other is seen that it's going to happen and is dealt with the best way that it can be under the circumstances. And it's said, well, again, another passage from the Heavenly Doctrine that says, the permission of evil by the Lord is not that of one who wills, or doesn't want it to happen, but of one who does not will, but who cannot bring aid on account of the urgency of the end, which is salvation. To leave a person in freedom to do even what is bad is called permission. So the Lord wants to get us to heaven if at all possible and sometimes has to allow bad things to happen for the sake of that eternal end. So the story of Adam and Eve is a good example or a good illustration of the Lord's providence and how he leads. And bear in mind, this is an allegorical story of a people or the very earliest church and how the Lord created a church where people gave them wonderful freedoms, gave them all that they needed, gave them spiritual uh, benefits and goods, and they were created and given all that, was provided for them. And they were also given freedom. They had the ability, if they wanted to, to choose what's evil. They could also choose what's good, is to trust in the Lord and to know that the Lord provided all things and eat of the tree of life. And they had to be free to go against that if they wanted, or that freedom wouldn't be real. So the Lord spells it out for us. It does the same thing for us. He says, here's the choice. I'm giving you a choice between life, happiness, and death, unhappiness. Which will you choose? And of course, the Lord is always trying to lead us to what's good. And if something bad is chosen, it's not the Lord's will, but it's done out of permission. So even though they made a bad choice and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and were kicked out of the garden, the Lord is still there caring for them and leading them. And life has to change because every decision we make has a series of consequences which extend to eternity. Every choice we make has ramifications. So they could have continued to live in the garden. They could have never done that, but they did do it. And so the Lord has provided, or from his foresight, has provided for their life to go forward. I'll give you some examples of that as a parent, a parent with a child. Our goal, of course, for our children is for them to learn and to grow and we lead them, but sometimes we have to let them make choices that are hurtful to them. And we hopefully are guiding them in a way that they hurt themselves just a little bit and not hurt themselves in a very bad way. A classic example, of course, is, is a hot stove. Sometimes you let them just touch near it a little bit, realize that it's hot rather than stick their whole hand on it and really burn themselves. So they have to realize, oh, that's something that I can learn from. And we know that we can't make our children act a certain way. We can't always prevent hurts but we have children anyway, and we love them anyway, and we do the best we can, kind of like what the Lord is doing in his divine providence. Now, I think the laws of permission with which the writings spell out help explain this in a summary sort of way. The first law of permission is that every person is an evil. Let's admit it. We all have those issues. We all have tendencies towards bad things. So every person is an evil, and must be led away from evil that he or she may be reformed. In other words, we have growth that needs to happen. We need to change. The second thing is that evils cannot be removed unless they appear. So unless you know what it is that, that the problem is, if, if you don't know what your issue is, you can't fix it. It's like going to the doctor, and if your doctor doesn't have a chance to examine you and see what your issues are, you can't get help and get better. And that explains also why bad things can occur because they allow us to see what it is within ourselves that might need to change, and we can do something to stop it. The third thing is that so far as evils are removed, they can be pardoned, which, of course, the Lord's goal is that everybody, if possible, could get to heaven and a life of happiness. So those evils can be seen, and they can be removed, and therefore pardoned. And thus, the final one is thus, the permission of evil is for the sake of the end, which is salvation. So the Lord allows those things to occur so that people can wake up, so people can change their lives and live differently and go to heaven. That's sort of the ultimate goal. Now, the story of Joseph is another example from the Lord's word that, that sort of illustrates this as well, where Joseph was the beloved son of Jacob and he gave him that coat or that tunic of many colors and his brothers were jealous and they wanted to kill him. But instead, 
The Lord sort of bent their will. Instead of killing their brother, Reuben suggested, why don't we sell him? That way we can sell him to slavery and we get some money for it. And he was actually intending to go back and let him out of the pit later. But they put him into a pit and traders came along and sold him into slavery in Egypt. So one of the things, again, the Lord can bend our affections from something that's really bad to something that's less bad, just like he did with them. But in Egypt, Joseph rose to second in command of all of Egypt and was able to consult Pharaoh and say, there's going to be seven years of plenty. During those seven years, store up a fifth of everything that you have. And then there's going to be seven years of famine which follow. And during that year, those years of famine, you will have everything that you need. And Joseph says to all of his brothers, you know, you did actually intend evil to me by doing this. But God has turned it towards something good because he was allowed to save all of Egypt and save all of his people and all the people in the land around them. Here are Joseph's words. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So because the Lord is leading us, even through bad things, good will happen. And sometimes the Lord cannot stop the bad, but can lead us through the pain and the hurt of it and the fallout and lead us to good in our spiritual life, lead us to lasting good. Even when bad happens, good may be the result. So at the very least, it might have been permitted for some end that has to do with eternal happiness for someone, maybe it's you, maybe it's me, maybe it's all the people that are observing and learning about it. So last week, our prelude for church was Let It Be by the Beatles. And Glenn Alden happened to be watching that service. He's a pastor and he is going to be serving the church in Buklu and near Johannesburg in South Africa. And he wrote this article that was published on their online newsletter. And I read it and I just wanted to, to read part of it because I think it says a lot of nice things about this idea. It's coming full circle. He heard this the song. We are sharing the results of him hearing that song. So thank you, Glenn, for these words. If we choose to love, eventually we will also feel loss and grief. All trials or temptations involve the fear that we will lose what we love. Still, it is better to love. The Lord said, love one another as I have loved you. Trials strengthen and confirm us in loving. It is said our tears show us what we love. We can plan, reason, try to control, and yet we cannot keep ourselves safe from the experience of loss or pain. This is where let it be comes in. The words of wisdom are to accept that nothing happens by mistake. This is not to say that everything is of the Lord's will. Many things are of the Lord's permission. He permits what he does not will because he will be able to bring goodness out of it. That goodness doesn't always look good to us. It isn't always easy. You you don't get to the top of the mountain by walking on the easy path that leads gently downhill. So the message today is when you see some evil or injustice, you've been alerted. You've been made aware of it. There's beautiful passages that talks about it. When we see, when we have compassion, we know the Lord is alerting us to render aid, to help out. So we are awake to it now. And what good can we help to bring from it? What change can we make? How can we live differently? Let's use our human choice to assist the divine providence in bringing good from the bad that happens. I think we have to stop thinking that we can't do anything, that we just pray to God and God will make it all happen. Well, guess what? God works through us. If we are awake and aware, then we are part of the army that can and must bring change. We are the ones that have to step up and do the hard thing. It's scary and it's difficult. We have to become the change we want to see in the world, as the saying goes. So we have freedom and we have choice. And the Lord, with all of his divine providence, all of his power, is trying to lead to what's good. And when we see things that need change, we have been alerted. And now it's up to us to help out with the Lord's strength behind us. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, you have awakened us to how we can love each other better, more fully, more completely, more broadly. Help us to make the changes in the world that we would like to see happen. Help us to love. Help us to be open. Help us to 
not discriminate and hate, but to care and to love and to usher in to this world your heavenly kingdom that you are striving so earnestly to bring into our hearts, minds, and lives. Thank you, Lord. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We'll close with our final song, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah.
Thanks again so much for being here today. Um, may you be blessed. May you have a peaceful week. And uh, if you want to join us on the Zoom conversation, there is information on the posting there. You can join us. And um, yeah, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.